Hi everyone, it's Jack. I hope your week is going well. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Eric Zhou, the Chief Accounting Officer of Brex. Now, Eric, uh, before we get rolling here, please just say hi to our listeners so they know you're you're here with me at this very moment. Hello, everyone. What I haven't disclosed yet is the fact that Eric has a second life uh, that he leads as a podcaster. He is also the host of a podcast titled Controllers Classified, which I have a feeling you're going to become very familiar with. CFO Thought Leader, actually, is going to have the privilege of sharing with you a number of Eric's episodes throughout this season, and we'll allow Eric... Uh, in just a moment to give you the scoop as far as what he's up to with controllers fast, uh, classified. But first, I thought I'd just share with you how I first connected with Eric, which was last fall. I was at a technology conference and I was working the show floor, getting familiar with folks, looking at some of the technology, a lot of AI things happening out there. But there was a Brex booth and there was a nice person there who very, uh, I, I, I explained what I am up to that I interview CFOs regularly. And she very quickly uh, invited me to a breakfast being held the following morning by Brex for CFOs. Now, I'm not a CFO, but they were letting uh, media types like myself in. And who do I meet at the uh, front greeting everyone is, is Eric himself, the chief accounting officer of Brex. As I enter, uh, Eric uh, shares with me that he too has become a podcaster only recently back then. I think he only had a one or two recordings and they hadn't released the show yet. Uh, but I was very intrigued, and I, I thought it was spot on, some of what he shared with me at that po- place in time. We went in, we sat down, we had a nice breakfast, but they also had some really interesting discussions going on. Eric CFO, uh, Michael Tannenbaum, was at the table next door. Uh, not next door, but sort of beside us, uh, having an AI discussion. I think we began with automation, and then we moved over uh, to uh, AI, which Eric manned at our table. Uh, anyway, it was just that type of topic that was so timely and, uh, made, I think what Eric's up to with controllers classified also very timely. Now I mentioned Eric has a a second life as a podcaster, but it's actually, I think his third life because he's also someone who's very involved with, uh, the technology and he, and he actually serves as an advisor, uh, in, in some of the product development. That's what gets me excited about the podcast, that he's going to have this very unique perspective uh, to share. But I hope he'll explain further for us all of what he's involved with. Eric, please tell us about yourself. So I've been at Brex for five years. I was there when it was a 60-person company. We're now a 1,300-person company. And our product is so geared towards accountants and finance teams and the actual operations behind spend management. I've been counting kind of serving as a technical advisor for that product team this whole time. Um, And as we have been bringing uh, this product uh, in power for spend management to market, we've been thinking about ways to do outreach um, for controllers and the buyers of this product. And so when I'm in the, I was in a room with the kind of marketing leadership team and we're thinking about different ways to go through this since I advise on the product and I'm the persona that they're selling to. And the idea of maybe a podcast for controllers and accountants came up. We haven't seen very many of those kinds of podcasts out there. And we thought it would be nice for Brex to sponsor one for our buyer base. And then we're thinking about different like podcast podcast hosts or someone else that we could sign on to kind of do these interviews. And then, I don't know, did someone just say, well, why don't we just get Eric to do it? You know, he seems like a personable guy. He asks good questions. And then I just felt, yeah, that sounds really interesting for me personally to get involved in something like this. Um, I do enjoy these questions. I do enjoy digging deep into the details of the day-to-day accounting operations uh, that companies go through. Um, and that's how this all got started. We, we know you're going to love it. Um, and it's interesting to look back in time to when we began CFO Thought Leader and, and we're quickly approaching our thousandth episode, by the way. Go go CFOs. <laughs> Early on, it wasn't always easy to get to yes when extending a, an invite to a CFO. In fact, many didn't necessarily see participation in a podcast that was listened to by other finance leaders as an ideal media opportunity. But as the CFO's role broadened, 
and and uh, finance leadership began really playing a more strategic role. CFO thought leader became a, a venue where I think many finance leaders realized they could reveal sort of their strategy credentials. They could talk about the strategic vision of their companies. And it occurs to me that this is now true for so many other finance professionals in the fact that the roles are evolving. They're broadening in some ways, and the age of AI is only accelerating it. Yeah, uh, two things. First, congrats on a thousand episodes if you've crossed it already. That a ten-year track doing these uh, interviews—that's amazing. Yep, this spring, so, this spring. I don't want to. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Uh, two on on the question. Yeah, I think you know the finance job has evolved a lot. Over the last 10 years, I would say, I think w- whether it's the CFO or the CEO or the controller or any kind of member of the finance team, they're being asked to contribute more to the strategy of the company. It's more than just booking the debits and credits, looking at the numbers, reporting the revenue, looking at costs overall. It's determining ROI and it's determining the right methodology to calculate ROI. So you have to work more in tandem with the actual business and all the departments that you serve and help them get smarter about their own functions and, and, and business, right? So, you know, you, you can serve as that analytical tool for these people and, and your partners across the company to do their job better. Um, and then for accountants specifically and for controllers specifically, I, 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 I strongly believe in the narrative that you mentioned, providing um, exposure to what that career path is for, for folks in my position as an accounting professional, as a CPA, um, and to shed, you know, a spotlight on the good work we do. And the, and I think the very interesting decisions, uh, that we end up making on, cause ultimately we're stewards of financial data. And so some of the decisions that we make as a foundation for that financial data for the company end up having an outsized impact on the financial analysis that can be done um, at the top level. And having listened to a few episodes, I know that's exactly what you're bringing forth in your discussions. So we're really happy uh, that we're going to have the opportunity to share a few of those uh, with our audience. Hey, who, who who's up first? Yeah, so the first person that I think you'll be syndicating is uh, Lindsay Oshida. Lindsay Oshida serves as a chief accounting officer of the Americas for Franklin Templeton. Uh, Franklin Templeton is a very large multinational uh, wealth management organization. Uh, They're a public company. And they've done some interesting things over the last few years. Um, They started with the Leg Mason acquisition um, from about five years ago or so. Um, And then recently they, um, and I don't know if they've closed it yet, but they're acquiring uh, Putnam Investments. So their AUM has really expanded significantly. Uh, And AUM stands for Assets Under Management over the last uh, five or so years. Um, and she had a lot of great stories about the integration. Yeah, so many great takeaways and lessons, right, from those those giant deals. Well, Eric, we look forward to uh, catching up with you from time to time throughout the year. But it's time, may I press the release button? Absolutely. Okay, everyone, as always, thank you for listening and welcome to the world of Controllers Classified. Thinking through sort of the financial design and and sort of that base level, taking extra time for that, right? How you build your hierarchies, how how do you build your chart of accounts, things like that that feel really mundane and like you could do later are actually the ways that you're going to set yourself up to have all the other work streams go more efficiently. Welcome to Controllers Classified, the podcast where we take a deep dive into the dynamic world of controllers, accountants, and finance leaders, and hear how their ever-evolving roles are redefining accounting and the future of business. And now, here's your host, Eric Zhou. Welcome to Controllers Classified. I'm your host, Eric Zhou, Chief Accounting Officer at Brex. Today, I'm honored to welcome Lindsay Oshida, the America's CAO at Franklin Templeton. Lindsay has spent nearly her entire career working her way up at Franklin Templeton. And as a fun fact, 
She also used to be one of my main clients when I was at PwC. The audit must have been okay because she's yeah. decided to join us on this show. But welcome, Lindsay. Thank you for joining. Thanks for having me, Eric. Why don't you just kick off by telling us a little bit about Franklin Templeton, your role there? So I've been at Franklin for just under 14 years now. I am responsible for external reporting, technical accounting, and also now have responsibility for controls, for SOX, um, external consolidation, and compensation accounting, as well as business support for the Americas. So that includes Canada, the U.S., and Latin America. I mean, Franklin Templeton, when I thought about my time serving you guys, huge multinational financial institution, you got operations everywhere. The Americas is obviously a big part of that. Tell me about before getting into Franklin, huge public company. Where were you at mm-hmm. before? How did you end up in accounting? I've never met anybody who, like me, decided that they wanted to be an accountant when they were 16. So a little unusual in that regard. I really liked math in, in high school and so decided accounting sounded like a good path for me. And I had an opportunity to work at a really small local accounting firm here in San Francisco when I was 16. So I worked there over the summers in high school through college. They, they let me continue working there. And it was a great opportunity for me to see what, in theory, accounting was. I did high net worth taxes, audits for nonprofits, and then the non, not-for-profit tax returns. So it, they didn't scare me away. They were wonderful people. And so after college, I, they, they actually encouraged me to go interview at the Big Four. And so I ended up working in the Deloitte um, San Francisco office for six years, focused on financial services. Uh, my dad was a banker for many years, his, his 50-year career at Wells Fargo. So I knew I wanted to be in financial services. Tech was, was not for me. But I did try out a whole, a whole slew of uh, industries when I was at Deloitte and really enjoyed my time and knew it was time for the next step. And I joined Franklin. And I guess the rest is a little bit of history. Yeah. When you were a client, you were in a core technical accounting role. And I believe you led all of global policy. uh, Correct. Yeah. Policy for Franklin. That's a big job in my view. Like, you know, I'll tell the audience, like, I kind of looked up to you, to be frank. Oh, Um, that's. Yeah. I mean, I'm a a technical accountant at heart. That's probably the most enjoyable parts of my core job at Brex. But now that you're in this CAO role, how has your how have your responsibilities expanded and how have you kind of adjusted to that that role it, it's interesting so actually in in 2019 i took on corporate accounting for the americas and and there was you know some some shifting parts and i actually for a short period of time gave up technical accounting and and even through my time when i led that group i always said you know, I loved it. It was always interesting, challenging. For me, the global aspect is actually really what continued to challenge and, and encouraged me to keep at it here at Franklin because I got to meet people from all over. You, you know, I worked with the, the team in Asia and team in Europe on a variety of things as they came up within the you know, within the business, right? How does that impact us? How are we thinking about that and, and achieving some some global standardization? And, and during my time doing technical accounting, I, I was able to do things like go and, and meet with the, the SEC and walk them through, you know, as an industry, what our views were on consolidation. I, when I was at Deloitte, I would say I did not expect myself to be such a technical accounting kind of nerd at heart. But when I joined Franklin, you know, it was right when FAS 167 came out. And I really enjoyed, and this is going to sound very nerdy. I really enjoyed being able to like read the standards start to finish and and see how it came together and the thought process and the logic around it. You know, and and when you're in public accounting, you don't really have time or opportunity to do. But but adjusting to that and and kind of taking taking what I learned from that and applying it to the sort of controllership role has been good. And I think working with folks and, and giving, you know, people who maybe came up through really the closed process, which I didn't have direct experience in learning from them, you know, in the day-to-day, and then also taking what I've learned and help them grow in that way, I think hopefully they they will say was beneficial for kind of both sides. When I, um, and I still run aspects of technical accounting at Brex, and I did a lot of the memo reviews when I was at PwC, the audit firm that I was at. 
you know, when I was at PwC, I always looked at it from a standards perspective, like gap, 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 like make sure it's compliant with gap. Does this make sense? Now that I'm on this side of the fence, I, I've realized the goalposts can be pretty wide and that there can be a lot of diversity in practice. When you were in that technical accounting role, how did you balance that? Like, you know, you guys are a public company too. So you're dealing with investors, you know, what your reporting goes out to the street. They judge your mm-hmm. stock based on that. How did you think about that? So it, it was always sort of looking at what, in, in how we approached it was looking at what the standard setters, like what problem were they trying to solve? What did they feel like needed clarity and you know, ultimately, also, what do investors look for? What information are they are they really trying to understand about the company? And I think the the approach we've always taken is, what is the most useful information for the investor to understand our business and and what we do, right? And making sure our disclosures align to that, how we account for things, and also balancing, you know, the the letter of the law and the operations of it. So, taking what exactly what you said, right? What the standard actually says, and then understanding how do we operationalize that and make sure we are in compliance that we're th- always thinking about kind of what that rule is and how do we build a process around that. Now that you're in your role, the, has it's shifted to like now that you have you have to operationalize it too now, right? Correct. It was it was a little easier when I was in policy and, and I didn't have the teams who actually had to do the the work of it. And so I think, you know, I I have a new perspective, I would say, on, you know, what things, you know, materiality, when you're in audit, you know, you think about that and and it's it's not just, okay, well, individually, but how do we get comfortable? You know, what are the things that keep me up at night? You know, what are the things that keep my bosses up at night? But but yeah, making sure ultimately that we go back to the heart of it and and that we are compliant. And obviously now I have I have socks. You know, so so also thinking about really from a risk perspective, wh- where are our riskiest areas and making sure we're putting the resources in the right place and, and the sort of brain power to those areas. For the audience, Franklin Templeton is a, is a September 30th year end. So your year end is coming up, 10K time. Yeah. What, what's on your roadmap leading into year end and potentially even going into next year if you've already thought about that kind of planning? We, we do. And, and, you know, I think over the last, especially over the last few years, we, we have acquired quite a number of companies. And, you know, I think every year what we try to do is look at what we disclose and, and taking a fresh look at, at how we describe things, you know, what we're saying out in, you know, with the SEC and out in the public and, and making sure we're, we take a fresh look at that, right? So just because we've always descri- described something a certain way, you know, it, it we definitely look at look at that every year as we lead up to the the 10k process, and we work really closely with you know our investor relations teams and and make sure that all the documents that are moving together during sort of the preparation phase. And Eric, I know you probably deal with this, you know, that they all sort of jive together and that it, it's really telling a cohesive story um, and, and describing what's happening in the business appropriately. And then, you know, planning for the future, we we recently announced that that we entered into an agreement to to purchase Putnam Investments, and so you know that will be a big one for us for for next year. And I think that that will take up a, a good chunk of of our time. And again, you know, every time we approach an acquisition, each one is unique and different. But making sure we we approach it and and look at the strengths um, of the teams coming together. You know, when we did the Lake Mason deal back in 2020. You know, I think I have truly benefited from my colleagues that came over from that group. They have a different perspective. Obviously, everyone has their own experience. And I think we're a stronger organization for kind of having that collaboration of, of, of thoughts come together. And tell me a little bit about, I mean, so you're going to buy Putnam mm-hmm. or you've already entered into a definitive agreement to buy Putnam. You had a huge transaction a few years ago with Leg Mason. Right, you acquired like mm-hmm. Mason. What? What? Tell me about that integration with that team because I think they're based out of Baltimore, right? And you guys are kind of okay. West Coast based in San Francisco. So, yes. like, tell me about that. I think it was during the pandemic too. That that must have been difficult trying to organize it all. 
And what lessons are you going to take from that into Putnam going into this upcoming year? So, so they are based in the East Coast, and I, I tell folks my days start a little earlier. Their days go a little longer. Everyone just kind of, you know, adjusts to, to working on both coasts. It was. We announced that deal right before, you know, really pandemic, you know, all the lockdowns. So it was interesting. Normally during an acquisition, especially of that size, you would have people getting together, sitting in a room, hashing things out, you know, spending a few days together. We didn't have that benefit, but we all got really used to, you know, teams and and being on video. My teams prior to that had all been, all my direct reports were outside of San Mateo. So I had sort of already gotten used to that, but working from home, I actually think we achieved a ton because of the pandemic. You know, folks weren't going out, they weren't, you know, vacationing. They did take some vacations, but, you know, people just kind of sat down and and got through it. But, you know, we really, especially within finance, I think we merged the two teams. So it wasn't a our way or their way. You know, the 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 message from from management, which I think is was well received and, and really needed, was you take sort of view A and view B and maybe come up with view C as you two, you know, as the two groups talk together. And I think we've been really successful in that and, and sort of merging. The, the cultures were fairly similar, so that was that was helpful. But, you know, we had sort of also taken a, an opportunity to relook at how we had organized finance. And so we, we also redesigned. And so we, we now have, you know, sort of centers of excellence, folks who specialize in certain areas like leases or revenue recognition, which I think give give different opportunities to folks than sort of your typical corporate accounting structure. Was that different than how Franklin was organized before? Like, like what was it like before in terms of looking at those kinds of areas versus where you're at now after the like merger? So we historically had been really kind of entity focused. And so there were folks who who focused on broker dealers. I know that that's what, you know, when you were your time with with us, Eric, you know, so we still have specialists in certain areas, broker dealers, et cetera. But and, and then like leases, for example, or revenue recognition, when I was sitting in the policy side, it was it was training and educating a whole slew of folks from around the world on on what it means, what our policy it was and is and how they should implement that. And and now it's we have sort of a central revenue team who who we work with. My policy team works with closely on those technical issues, but it is very focused. And so you you get the good a, a different perspective, right? They 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 then look at it across the globe, across multiple gaps, and so they they get the opportunity. All of folks in each individual team to really dig in, understand, and and build up some of their technical knowledge in that regard. Do you think you'll lose out on some of the, you know, because sometimes some of these statutory audits and statutory financials, they're giving a holistic view of just that entity, and you don't need to bring in everything from around the globe. Do you still have those folks that look after those entities and are responsible for the holistic view of that particular business? We do, we do. So so that is really kind of, so, you know, part of my team overseeing business support and and the CAO office, if you will, for the Americas, it's business support, it's regulatory and statutory financials. And and my counterparts in Asia and Europe do the same. So they are heavily involved with the business, can then take the the books and records, build the financials, tell that story similarly to the board or to the regulators in those jurisdictions. So I think we've been able to kind of manage the best of both sides. You get that specialty um, and then have folks who are more connected with the business. And then the other piece to that is actually then we have an opportunity for folks to rotate through. So the teams, and, and we have quite a large team in, in Hyderabad out in India, that they get an opportunity to see those different things and, and build their career, not just linearly, but you know they can move to different teams, learn something new um, and, and, and grow in that way and, and continue to build their career. So speaking of Hyderabad, actually, I think I think it's an interesting segue. You know, I have outsourced personnel also. I use Genpact. We have a team of about seven folks. They do a lot of our daily cash reconciliations, AP processing, work that I think, you know, it's bookkeeper level work. We, we have those folks do it. We decided to outsource that because it was easier on us because it's only seven folks. I guess like for you, how do you think about for Franklin, and now you're monitoring kind of like this operational team in India. 
bringing it in house and, and maybe that decision was made a while ago but like do you see the benefits of that is there any thought of like taking it out, out outsourced again like how do you think about that no so we definitely made a decision early to invest in india we also have a, a group in poland and to build that team i think we have seen the benefit of having that we we're such a large organization that it, it is significantly larger than a seven person team and and i think for us it's it's been great to see some of the folks that we hired when we first you know opened the campus really move up through the ranks become leaders in their respective area and so for us we we see the benefit we we've invested in those folks and you know really see them as part of the future leadership team here at Franklin so so the the question does come up you know we we definitely believe they are part of the team they're part of sort of the Franklin family and and have seen definite benefits out of that makes sense all right going back to the merger well there's the before and then there's the after so after the merger now that you're actually officially reporting as a combined unit what changed about your operate like like what were the most difficult parts of making sure things continue to run smoothly post merger or did you kind of still run two different ships and then we're still working on it so we closed the deal 2 months before our year end so i would say that first year end was was we were it was our first year end during the pandemic so everyone was working from home it was a little more there was more stress in the system i would say you know we we did maintain um you know their their system and that has really then we we took the opportunity to b- integrate that over time and and to be thoughtful about that sort of concurrently we also had looked at our you know financial system and and decided to also make a change so there were a lot of things in flight and so we took the opportunity to say what's the best path and how do we get there together and so did a whole year there was a change during that time correct yeah it was it was after boat but it was sort of in flight at that time and then and then leg was also on a different erp correct wow so you had yeah. migrations for two different erp systems into a new one basically because of the merger correct yeah yeah i guess i i don't know how to think uh, uh, how <laughs> I mean there's a little bit of also the data would have had to come. I mean I don't know how historicals would have worked but like that must have been a huge IT commitment. Like I'm just thinking through the the manpower it, it was. Take. Yeah. It was. And and you know I think we we implemented so we're now on workday and and we implemented that at the start of this fiscal year. But that obviously that was a huge lift over the last, you know, year year and a half. And there's still pieces that are are coming together as as we've moved. Leg was actually on workday but a different instance. So so you know there were learning things for us not being on workday, having that come up. But but again, I think taking the opportunity to look at both processes, you know, how they did it, knowing what they knew and had learned what did we do and we we were previously on peoplesoft how we thought we should build it and it, it again it was sort of a this is how we did it this is how they did it in the old system you know if we had a clean sheet of paper and knowing what we knew knowing what we know now what would we do and you know there there continues i would say to be learnings over that and you know with any erp implementation things change and as you settle into the system there are aspects to that that you know you continually refine and i think that's also been a really big part of the the culture of the sort of combined organization is how do we make things more efficient you know how do we think about things differently and work differently to to be smarter with our resources and and you know thoughtful in that way and how long were you guys on peoplesoft before i want to say 20 years okay Yeah, so I I kind of like I'm hearing this story and I'm thinking that's actually a great sequence of events. Yes. Because I feel like if you didn't have the work day implementation already lined up, you know, now you're bringing in whatever leg was doing onto PeopleSoft or or maybe you move your stuff onto their instance of work day however mm-hmm. you want to design it. But now that you're combining two big companies, like given that you were already implementing workday you're giving yourself a green field like you can almost reimagine like to your point right all these processes that you may have had had for 20 years right cuz someone mm-hmm. made the decision on how to do fixed assets 20 years ago yep. and people saw it and people just roll it forward year after year 
now with the new implementation and with the merger, it, it sounds like a whole lot of work, but it feels like the ROI setting yourselves up for the next 20 years is, yes. is immense. Yeah. And, and so, you know, we kicked off, I want to say, quickly in 2021, <clears throat> the full workday kind of project. And we were really ambitious in what we, we thought the timeline was to implement, you know, and, and looked at all the risks and, and decided to start of the fiscal for 2023 was the best timing. But, but yeah, it was sort of full, 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 full speed ahead, really. Any tips for like what to look out for? in such a big project? I would say thinking through sort of the financial design and and sort of that base level, taking extra time for that, right? How you build your hierarchies, how how do you build your chart of accounts, things like that that feel really mundane and like you could do later are actually the ways that you're going to set yourself up to have all the other work streams go more efficiently if you're really thoughtful in in that aspect of it. So we had a whole team dedicated to that. You know, I think that would be as sort of as you implement, once you decide, you know, what system you're going to use, that is really the key that unlocks so much. For um, our listeners, can you just, what's so important about the chart of accounts? Like what, what do you mean by isn't it just a set of numbers? You start with one, right. you go to a million, like what's the, what's the big deal? Like what, like what no, are you talking it, about? And Eric, I don't recall if this ha- happened when you were there, but we actually, you know, over the years, when you have a chart of accounts, people add to it and, you know, it, it might be used initially for one thing, very specific. It could be regional specific. That then gets morphed over time. And then people don't really remember what it was initially set up for. So years ago, and this was even before we even had an inkling of, of workday or changing, we had gone through... And it was an idea that came from one of the the supervisors and managers in our team in Canada. She had the idea, we really need to go through and revamp this, right? Look at how we're using it globally. And so we set up a committee and it was a two-year project to really solicit feedback from every region. How are people using the accounts, making sure we were comfortable where that landed in our in our ledger, and also thinking through how the process worked and and do we need a expense and liability one for one mapping or should we be pulling those to, you know aggregating that and have a true reconciliation so questions that and and I think it was good I was sitting in policy at the time because you're removed from the the day-to-day operations so you can challenge people to think about it differently and and you know sometimes it was well this is how people soft works this is how the system works you have to do it this way. And so taking all of that not learning that we did and, and a lot of the revamping and cleanup and then taking it that step further, understanding how the system works and we went with Workday, how that works and how we can make it work for what we want in a way that gives us data more readily to how we would analyze it, how we would talk to our CFO, how we would talk to the street about that. How do we slice and dice it and making sure the operations then balanced with that. And then even small things like you run out of numbers. So yes, you start with one and go down, but if you only have 10, that's a very small window of things. That, and I think you know, what you're of, saying of, is like, and this is how I did my chart of accounts, like my first digit, I call it the mm-hmm. major class. Yep. So if it's a one, two, three, or four, it, it denotes if it's an asset, a liability, equity account, et cetera. The second mm-hmm. two digits may denote the subsidiary yep. is related to the the fourth digit exactly. be location. You know, each yes. number in a ten digit string or what have you denotes yes. something about what the account is attributable to. So I exactly, think, yeah. and then it helps you know folks as they get used to those new numberings. It's like, oh, okay, it's it's in the you know one thousand. Okay, I know that's an asset. I know that's cash, and kind of the same for companies because we are such a global organization. How many numbers do you really need? Do you have more than a hundred number, you know, a hundred entities in a given region? So kind of similar. We we do, you know, first digit is is the Americas, which which then included, you know, Latin America, Canada, and and organized it that way. And then for us, we have to consolidate quite a quite a number of our products just as a result of some seed that we put in. 
So where do we put that in, in, the, in the numbering scheme? How, did, how does that get organized? So little things like that that, that help, from my perspective at least, as we, as we structured it so that way we could group things how, how we think about them as an organization and giving us enough space to continue growing. Um, so then you don't have that you only have three digits and once, you, once you're past you know, the 100s, you then have to go to an 800. And so then, you're, you know, your regions are in a couple different places. Um, I want to go back to a comment you had about having one expense account for every liability account or vice versa. Mm-hmm. And I, I went through this when I was designing the, CEO, the chart of accounts at Brex. Yeah. And yeah, we had one for everything. We had, I wanted to do like one account, like we have different advertising and marketing expense accounts, right? So we have one. Mm-hmm for sales and promotional giveaways, one for outdoor ads, one for something else, blah, blah, blah. Right, right. And then I had an AP account for each one. And then I was like, oh, let's have also an accrued liability account for each one. And mm-hmm. I think I, I mean, I, I, I kind of look back at it and we, we now have consolidated, mm-hmm. but if it, it, it like very quickly, it felt overboard because it's just too much. It's too much for like my folks in India that are doing all the AP invoicing. It's too much. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, um, did you guys get to the same conclusion? I'm curious. I think part of it is because I sat in the technical side, to me, it was, well, when I look at it, I, you know, at the ledger, when I get a report, well, to me, it made sense that we would have, okay, marketing, you know, here's all of our marketing accrual all in one place, um, to use your example. And I think the operations team, you know, really the accountants, it was a shift in how they thought. I think now, especially with Workday, there, there's some other capabilities and, and categories that we can use. And so we've definitely leveraged that. And so it's, okay, what's the right level? You know, your account level, that, that's that aggregate number, but you have sort of for us spend categories. So you can break it down if someone were to need that level of detail. But you know, when, when we send a report to a CA, you know, the, our, our corporate CAO, she doesn't need necessarily all that level of detail, and so it's it's aggregated at the at the right level. So we moved away. We we definitely and and probably we were I was one of the folks who pushed and challenged folks to to aggregate and think about what you know what really needs to be account versus sort of that sub ledger yeah. detail. So one one thing that we we haven't touched upon, and I'm just curious about it. You spent you know a number of years at Deloitte made your way to Franklin, worked your way up. I mean, I, I still, I, I think I still look up to you. It's pretty cool. Oh. Good job. Yeah. Tell me about during that whole journey, was there any role of mentorship or sponsorship for you? Have you done that for others? Did you receive that? I'm assuming so. That's that, I mean, that's what got me to where I am in some ways. But how does that work at, at Franklin? So, you know, we have, I would say, a number of different avenues for that. So at Deloitte, you know, definitely. And, and I think public accounting is really good at structuring that. You have a counselor, you know, you get assigned certain people who, who officially are your, you know, sort of advocates. And over time, that may change and you, you obviously develop relationships. For me, you know, I've always taken the approach, and, and probably because I worked in a small office, that, you know, I have found sort of mentors, if you will, in different aspects, right? So to me, it doesn't, it doesn't always have to be somebody that's higher in the organization. You can learn from anybody, right? So it could be that, you know, I look to, you know, an accountant level person because they have this experience and that, you know, knowledge. And so, hey, I, I need to grow in that area, you know, so, so how do I connect with those folks? But, but I definitely have had great sponsors and and mentors in my career at Franklin, you know, my former boss, my current boss, you know, they, they are, I, I'm open with them. I have those conversations about what I want out of my career, you know, where I want to go, things that are interesting. I've, I've been lucky that, that they've offered me things that continue to challenge me and grow. So it's not like I've, I've needed to really seek that out. And then, you know, Franklin also has, various programs that, that they, you know, have us as part participate in strategic leaders where you officially ask somebody to be, to be a sponsor, if you will. And for me, I, you know, reached out to somebody from Lake Mason. So somebody who I hadn't, didn't have quite that same, you know, 
experience and, and history with to, to learn from them, right, and, and get that different perspective. So I've, I think I've been really lucky in that it, it's happened. And then, you know, sort of outside of work, my, my, my dad actually had worked in, in internal audit at Wells Fargo for quite a number of years. And one of his, he always describes him as his best boss. He ended up moving up the ranks. He actually had also come from, I believe, Deloitte. But, you know, he has always been a great mentor for me, you know, when things have come up, if I, if I need to bounce something off of him, he's always been willing to, to talk to me. And he, he moved into a number of different operations and, you know, moved around in his career. And I think the, the best advice he gave me as I was thinking about things, as I was thinking about leaving Deloitte was, you know, find things that it doesn't necessarily have to be a change in role or a change in title, but it has to be something that you are continuing to grow and add a new tool to your tool belt or toolbox, right? And for me, for whatever reason, that really stuck because it's easy to say, oh, I, I, you know, I think I'm going to go to that company. I, I want to do X, Y, or Z. And he would always challenge me as I was thinking about things, you know, between Deloitte and here. Well, is that going to give you a different experience? Is that going to continue your path to grow? And, and will you add anything? Or are you just redoing what you've already done? And it's a, it, for me, it was a great perspective. And, and I've kind of continued to think about that through my career. Yeah, I, I think, and you've probably seen the articles, you know, the accounting profession isn't getting as many new entrants as it once was every year. Maybe they're all becoming software engineers. I think the community aspect of our profession of our profession is extremely important. The mentorship that we can provide to others, the mentorship, frankly, that I'm still receiving from many others, it's one of the highlights of 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 the work. I think, you know, it's one of those jobs where, in theory, to your point, the more you work, you age like a fine wine. Like the more experience you get, the more tools you get. Like you know, it's it's one of those kinds of professions. So that's great. I, I love hearing kind of like that whole story about your your own your own mentorship and sponsorship and opportunities you've been, you've been given. Maybe to close out, I have just one more question. We end each of these podcasts with something fun. So do you have an accounting joke to share with our audience? I actually have two. And so one you'll probably appreciate from your time in public accounting. And it was, it's, why did the accountant cross the road? No idea. <laughs> Because they looked in the files and did what they did last year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so good. So, and then the other one. So an accountant is having a hard time sleeping, goes to see their doctor, says, Doc, I just can't get to sleep at night. And the doctor says, well, have you tried counting sheep? And, and the accountant replies, well, that's the problem. At some point I make a mistake and then I spend three hours trying to figure out what went wrong. <laughs> Which that one, I was like, oh, yeah, we've, we've all been there, right? <laughs> it's oh, the one Lord. thing. <sighs> you know, for, for the, for the non-accountant listeners, if we have any on this show, so long. I, we might never hear from you again. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, oh, yeah, that, that's too no, much. That's good. That's, good. that's really, it really touches, touches me. No, that's good. Lindsay, thank you very much for joining us on Controllers Classified. Honor that you join us today. And just thank you. Yeah, great. No, thank you, Eric. I appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in to Controllers Classified, presented by Brex. Brex is an AI-powered spend platform with global corporate cards, expense management, reimbursements, and travel. Visit brex.com and follow Brex on social to see how they can take your accounting game and your company to new heights.